you have nothing against, uh, I'm saying nothing bad about you. Enjoy. <laughs> 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 the way you is perfect, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Moldovian of Sukhoma Susitixa. Shekhev was Russian, the professor was from the Russian, the professor was from the Russian, Я делаю карту, профессор Испания, а другие гости Рейд, да, да, сюда, да, куда-нибудь, да, до как приезжали на Расте интернет, а мы с тобой по сайкам, фантастическую историю, да, фантастическую историю. Так, я был сорван больше, потому что я немного поинтересовался тебе и твоих работах, и да, до того, пока ты сделал. Да, все, все, все. Так, я Well, maybe you. I, 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 uh, I, I only figures from one small or two small slides. That I talk about. But you, oh, you talk about that. That's very good. So, because we're going to be slain at okay. 30 minutes and 30 minutes. Here is our bit of So, now we, we could start. I, I will introduce you afterwards. This is our, our guest, the person I've been talking about. Because she is a story already. And we can turn off lights, right? We can turn off lights. So now I made that introduction in Ukrainian. Everybody knows perfectly who you are. Okay. And uh, all interested. So we're turning off the lights and you start. Professor, okay. Prime, Professor Lee. So I'm going to give you 30 minutes of uh, geo geoscience, archaeology, uh, and the Holocaust. And then my colleague, Professor Phil Reeder, will give you 30 minutes of how we map everything so it is all documented with GPS coordinates. So if somebody in another 30 years or 50 years wants to go and visit these sites and they have been changed, because you know, think change happens, developments happen, that they will have maps that people can use and the GPS coordinates will not change. Is everybody with me? Yes? I want to make sure everybody's understanding what I'm saying because I'm embarrassed but I am happy that I'm coming to speak about geoscience, archaeology, and the Holocaust from the field today. So I'm, I hope you're not too embarrassed for me, or don't, I do not smell well, but I, the, the nice reason that I'm doing this is because we're talking about the Holocaust and we're talking about archaeology, and we put on nice suits and we put on ties and we talk about them and everybody feels good about each other, but it, it's a dirty business, and I want to explain to you how we have changed the way that this work is being done. So very clear, so we do not victimize the victims a second time. Does everybody understand what I just said? Okay, so geoscience is using different techniques that will give us an MRI or an X-ray for the ground so that before we do anything, before we touch anything in an area, we know what's there. Would, can you imagine, let me make sure that this is going to be working now so that I can do this. There we go. Do you want to? Okay. There we go. Can you imagine going for major surgery and not going to have an MRI or an X-ray or a CAT scan? So why is it in archaeology, which is the most destructive science on Earth, it's the only science where you can never repeat the experiment ever again. When you move things, change things, you can never repeat the experiment again. So about 30 years ago, I started to have an idea that we had to try to do something differently. Uh, archaeology not only is destructive, it's expensive, it's labor intensive, it's ins insensitive, and sometimes it's unnecessary. It's just unnecessary. So when I started to think about this, I started to gather a group of people who are doing geoscience in different areas. So. The two techniques I'm going to be talking about, I'll show you very simply, but I want everybody to repeat after me. Ground. Ground. Penetrating. Penetrating. Radar. Radar. Okay, so 
Ground penetrating radar is one technique. It involves FM radio waves, like in the car, and it shoots the FM radio waves into the ground. It comes back and reflects against anything that's down there. There is a computer with a very sensitive array that will then tell us what's there, and it can detect very large structures underneath the ground, but only to about three, four, five meters, okay? Many of the things that we've, we've found, unfortunately, are below five meters. So what were you going to do? So another geoscience technique that I'm going to be talking about is, repeat after me, electrical. Electrical. Resistivity. 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 Tomography. 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 Just like a tomography that you would go to the hospital to get, this is an MRI for the ground. And you know who uses this? Gas and oil exploration. So I went to speak to the largest gas and oil exploration company in the world in Calgary. And they get a very bad name. I don't know if you know, they do bad things to the, they frack and they schmack and they dack and they're, they're destroying the environment. I went to the man who, is the, who runs this company and I said, how would you like to put on your website saving civilization one site at a time? So this man who was the head of that, very, he says, you know, this would be very, this would be very interesting. And he actually, I said, what do you need? How much is it going to cost us? This is a billion dollar corporation. I said, nothing. It's not going to cost you anything. You have to lend us, the university, the equipment, lend us two geophysicists, and we will go from site to site, and we will be able to detect what's there. And whatever we, we do, you can put on your website and say, saving civilization one side at a time. Guess what he said to me? I like that. I like that. And that is really what we've been doing for the past 20, 22 years in the field. We've done 40 sites in Israel, in Spain, Poland, Greece, and now Lithuania. 40 sites. And what I wanted to explain to you today, just very simply, is why this is important for the Holocaust. We are not Holocaust archaeologists. What we do is, we do anything where there's a sensitive problem. So for example, Professor Reeder and I are working with a number of geoscientists, geophysicists, and we're working today in a place called Nazareth, Israel. Have you ever heard of Nazareth, Israel? <laughs> we're working on the Church of the Annunciation. At the same time we're working on the Great Synagogue, we're working on the Church of the Annunciation. Now, what happened? We're working in Nazareth, and the church that is there is from the 19th century. Renovations, so they were having a water problem. They were having a water problem in the church, and they said, could you use your, your ground penetrating radar to help us with the, well, we're not plumbers, but we said, yes, we can do that. While we were looking at the church floors, we discovered an earlier church six feet below the Church of the Annunciation, the original Church of the Annunciation, which for Christianity, on a scale of one to 10, is after the, maybe, maybe number one or number two, in the most important holy site for Christianity. So this technology is so important because it allowed us not to rip up a 19th century church in order to look for the floor, which we knew was there, but rather to go to a place like this, to find a way in, and then do pinpoint archaeology. And I have to tell you that we're going back now. They have now excavated the entire floor of this original church, and the church is building another church behind the 19th century church, where the original church, where people, Christians from all over the world can go without destroying the church that was there. Is everybody with me? Yes. Okay, good. So now I'll give you a little bit more about this. So 
I talk about research, he's going to be talking about research, but I want to tell you, it's not about research. You know who it's about? The students. I hate to tell you this, but if we do not create a new generation of students that are going to go out to the field to do this work, there will not be any work done. Or it will be done in the old-fashioned, destructive manner. So part of what we do is we bring together different disciplines in science, different dis disciplines in history, different disciplines in archaeology. We go out to the field with students. And I have to tell you, all of the work is done by the students. We mentor them, but that is really what it's all about. So just some of the places, there's the Church of the Annunciation, a nice marble floor, there's my student Vanessa, there's Paul Bauman. Oh, I need to tell you something about this, the gas and oil industry. The gas and oil industry, you know what they do when they do this, their electrical resistivity tomography? They can look down 60, 70 feet, 30, 40 meters below the surface. And they developed a software that can tell the difference between the electrical resistance between anything on Earth. So any organic matter that we have stone, they can tell the difference between stone and bone and metal and glass and ceramic and fired pottery and non-fired pottery. Because everything has a different resistance to the electricity. And it comes back, you know how? With a color-coded chart immediately. You don't have to wait six months, two years, five years. We'll, maybe we'll do something in another ten years. This is an immediate process where you can see it on the screen. Because the gas and oil industry doesn't want to wait five minutes. If there's gas and oil there, or if there's natural resources there, they want to get to it as soon as possible. So this is the reason why no university on Earth could ever afford this technology. You understand? Because they have to be completely updated all the time. But the gas and oil industry, private industry, does have the ability to do this. Okay. If you haven't seen my documentary on Atlantis, we found Atlantis. I don't want to tell you where, I'll tell you where it is, it's southern Spain. So if you ever really want to go on a vacation, you can say, I'd like to go to Atlantis. It's in southern Spain in a massive, massive marsh located to the south of Seville, all the way down to Cadiz. It's the largest marsh in Europe. 250 square meters, kilometers. It's huge, massive. It's a massive uh, uh, site in southern Spain. It used to be open to the bay, but something happened, an earthquake and then sedimentation, and looking from space, they discovered that it was there embedded in the earth, but nobody could get to it because nobody can excavate in a marsh. But we can. So part of this is just to be able to identify sites that cannot be done with traditional archaeology. Uh, this is Sobibor. Have you ever heard of Sobibor? Please shake your heads. Sobibor. The death camp. The death camp. Sobibor. Yeah, the, the movie Sobibor, which was released. Recently, That's right. But was shot in, in Windows. I know. No, yes. it wasn't shot. It was uh, Fort Seven. Yeah. A new one. Is A new one, yes. But this is the real story. Yes. And uh, the excavations there, they didn't know how to excavate the site because there's 250,000 people buried there. Where do you start? The Nazis were so embarrassed after the escape from Sobibor, they covered it all over with dirt, planted trees on top. Ironically, preserving it for all time. And when we went and did scans of Sobibor back a decade ago, it was all still there. It hadn't been changed, it hadn't been developed, it hadn't been made into a park yet. So part of this is to save sites that have not been touched yet and that can be excavated in certain areas. And so what did they do? They excavated all the areas where the gas chambers were. They excavated all the areas where the Himmelfahrstrasse, where they came into the camp. Thousands and thousands of artifacts. 
And guess what they're doing? They're building a museum right on top of the installations of where Silverboard was. Could that have been done by traditional archaeology? Why not? Because it would have been destroyed. What they would have done is they would have dug up many bodies mm. in doing it. And they would have said, oh, this is so sad. But we have to stop the thinking that we have to dig up the victims and victimize them a second time. So that's why geoscience is what I call, and I coined a new phrase, it's called non-invasive archaeology. Non-invasive archaeology means you can find something without having to excavate it. Is everybody following me? Yes? Okay. So here's uh, Harry Joel who's coming in now. If you don't recognize that, that's the elementary school right down the block here. And in 2015 we went to see if the great synagogue was still there. The great synagogue is still there. Now, how do I prove that the great synagogue is there without destroying all the evidence? We mapped the entire great synagogue. He'll be talking about the, these great maps. And now we're excavating the great synagogue. We've all already taken out hundreds of thousands of artifacts, just so you know. Small artifacts. This is what the array looks like, just so you don't miss the point. Is this is, this, these are little posts that go in the earth. We have a car battery that we bring out to the site, and we run the array with uh, electrodes that are hooked up to these posts. The electricity goes into the earth, it then reflects back, and the software interprets what's below the surface. Does everybody understand the technique? It's very simple, but very expensive to do well. This is Professor Reeder's maps. This is what it's all about. Because in these maps of the Great Synagogue, this is the Great Synagogue, there's the elementary school in the middle. We knew exactly where to excavate. It's not like we just, oh, randomly, we're going to go out to the field, we're going to excavate someplace. We knew exactly where we're going to excavate. We started, by the way, in the back, in a place that was called the bathhouse. If you don't know that they, they, most of the Jewish communities had great bathhouses, it was a bathhouse there that it was an enormous three-story building that contained the life of the people. People who went to the bathhouse, and just so you know, Jews didn't have water in their houses. So guess what? If you were in the Jewish quarter, people went to the great synagogue three times a day to go to the bathroom, to gather water, to take a shower. And some people even went there to pray. Some people actually didn't go there to pray. But you see, this was the life of, of the entire community because of water. A simple thing like that. And so what we did was we tracked the water. And we now started the excavation. If you pass by, you can actually see now much of what we've already done about the, the great synagogue. This is what I talked about last night. This is what the good Nazi is about. If you don't know what Hakape is, you should read uh, Irina Gusenberg's book on Hakape. I read the book. Irina, who was a researcher at the Vilna Dolan Jewish State Museum, the Tolerance Center, took me out to the site. She says, we have to do something about this site. They're going to take it down very soon. It's going to be destroyed. Look, it's a great location. Great location. Those buildings were built in 1898. How much longer do you think they're going to be standing? So you have to be prepared. So I said, well, we'll see. What, will we, what are the scientific goals? So we set scientific goals. We wanted to see if the stories that the people who went to Hakape survived because not only of Major Plaga's compassion, but if they survived because there were Molinas, hiding places, and whether the Molinas, the hiding places, were still there. They are. Unfortunately, also, at Hakape, there are mass burials. We wanted to see whether the survivors who tell us that there was killing at the site and that not everybody was buried in the area where the final burial memorial was placed were 
and we found other mass burials at the site. So part of this is to take each one of the witnesses, to take the witnesses' accounts seriously, and to take them into the field, and to see if there is still more evidence that can be collected. But this is really what it's about. Students who sit, excavate, watch the finds, learn about it, because this is the way these millennials learn today. I don't know if you know about the millennial problem. I don't know if you have a millennial problem here. Millennials learn differently than they did in the past. So part of the millennial thing is they want to smell it, they want to taste it, they want to see it, they want to hear it, they want to be a part of it. And when they're in the field, I've been doing this over 35 years, they are the best generation in the field that I've ever seen. They, the earlier generation was really good in the classroom, <laughs> and they would get out to the field. You know what I'm talking about. They get out to the field and they say, do I have to get down to my knees? These are new jeans. And, 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 and these are new sneakers. These kids, they want to get down into the dirt. They want to be there and touch it. They want to experience not this. They want to experience real experience in the field. And for them, this is really one of the great experiences of their lives. So it is about them. It also is, uh, I've done now 20 television documentaries on archaeology using geoscience because I can go from place to place. And we, when we do these, these documentaries, we do them to educate the public. 20 million people saw the Holocaust escape tunnel. 20 million people. How many lectures will Zelvinas give where 20 million people will be able to view it as an experience? That's what we're, we really are hunting for. So just to show you what we've done now, this is the Holocaust Escape Tunnel. We've worked in uh, Kaunas. We've done five sites in Kaunas. We did one site in Shibute, uh, Vilnius, and this summer we're working in Rokishkis. Uh, in the north, Trakas, uh, Ponadel, and uh, Pane Munelis. So these are four sites. We are trying to do as many sites when we come in. When I come to the country, like Lithuania, and I offer to do a project, I offer for free, for free, to any group that has an archaeological project which we feel we can contribute to. Free. If I'm bringing you uh, half a million dollars worth of equipment, it, it's the same price if I'm bringing it. But I also want to participate with Lithuanian archaeologists. So part of this is, is to find Lithuanian archaeologists who will go to the field, who are interested in what we're doing, and will learn something new. So I don't have to tell you too much about uh, Ponar, Panare, I think you know about this. But this is really one of the techniques that we used. We took a 1944 photograph, and you know what we discovered at Panare? We discovered there were more burial pits than were presently in the visitor's guide. We found one pit that was 24 meters by 6 meters deep that had 10, 15,000 people in it. In the forest, what do we hope is going to be accomplished? That nobody develops that site. That they mark that site in the forest. That's part of the work. In the meantime, the Vilna Gaon Jewish State Museum, we had come to do the, the, the Great Synagogue. The Tolerance Center, Marcus Zingeris, said, you know what? There's a story about this Holocaust escape tunnel, and nobody can find it. You think you can find it? It took us two days to find it, using this equipment. I have to say that I would never expect the kind of interest But the, the tunnel is 15 feet, 5, 6, 7 meters in some places, 
below the surface. But we found it. And now, uh, a lot of people ask, so what, do you, what can you do? Nothing. You have to mark it to tell people when they go to burial pit number six at Panare that they can see this is where the entrance is and they can see this is where the tunnel went to. To educate the public about one of the great stories, life-affirming stories of great hope that happened in Lithuania. And I think it's a, a story that's worthy of Lithuanians embracing the story. I'm not going to give you too much about this, but worldwide, the story played in Africa, in Asia, it played in India, in South America, and was on the front page of the New York Times. It was voted one of the top stories, of science stories of uh, 2016. But I end by just telling one thing. I know you all think that, uh, that archaeology is about artifacts and walls and about uh, manuscripts and the finding of, of uh, boxes and things that are hidden. You know what archaeology is really all about? It's about people. Find the people behind those artifacts. Find the people behind the archaeology. Find the people, in this case, when these people found out about the tunnel, these were the grandparents, the, the grandchildren, and the parents. Their parents had gone through the tunnel. So their children, and their grandchildren, and their cousins, and their, everyone who knew those 11 survivors of the, of the tunnel, we sat down with them and we said, there was a tunnel. Because I have to tell you, some of them thought, in their heart of hearts, that their grandfather, the grandfather, their father, might have been exaggerating. And they felt a sense of closure. And I have to tell you, in life, there is very few moments where you can have closure. So if you're interested, you, um, I have a new book coming out next year. But if you want to watch the documentary, you can watch it on our site. You can watch it on the NOVA site. So thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. So Richard and I, we have worked together for 20 years now on these different projects. And I'm going to focus in on two of those tonight. Uh, I'm going to take us back to Israel and back to Nazareth and tell you a little more about that find. Because as Richard said, it's one of the most, if not the most, one of the most important discoveries for Christianity. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, and then I want to talk about the different things that we do in Lithuania as well. So this is the Greek Orthodox Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth. So as I said, we've been working together for over 20 years, and these are just some of the places that we've worked. Um, many locations in Israel, it's probably more than six now. Uh, I'm going to talk about Nazareth tonight. We worked at two places in Spain. Um, we worked, as Richard said, at the Soviet War Extermination Camp in Poland. We worked at Rhodes in Greece. And then in Vilnius and in Vilnius vicinity, what I'm going to talk about tonight is the Great Synagogue, Panare, or Ponar is the Yiddish, right? Right. Yeah, Ponar Forest, uh, something that we did at the Rassel Street Prison, and then at HKP as well. So here's a map of Israel. Um, these are some of the different sites that we worked at. And then in the north of Israel, that's where Nazareth is. Um, Nazareth, according to the Bible, was the town where Jesus was raised. Jesus Christ. He was born in Bethlehem. His family moved to Nazareth, and that's where he was raised. We worked at a place called Mary's Well uh, at the time of Jesus. Nazareth was just a very tiny little village. Um, why is it called Mary's Well? Mary was Jesus' mother. How do we know that it was the well she went to to get water? Because it was the only well in Nazareth to get water, so she had to get water from that well. And this is just a, a little taste of some of the things that we did in that particular area. So this is Mary's Well down here. And then this is very interesting here as well, and I'll tell you something about that. And then this is the Church of the Annunciation, and this is the area behind the church that Richard referred to. So um, the initial project at Mary well, Mary's Well, we were approached by someone who knew of a very good 
uh, an important archaeological discovery that was made by a private citizen. And the fact was that he had a shop and he needed more storage space, so he began to dig in the dirt floor and he uncovered an ancient bathhouse underneath of that shop. So we spent uh, two different seasons mapping that ancient bathhouse. And here is a plan of the Hippocaust. This is where the workers would be underneath with the fires and making the steam, and then would rise up through the floor. And they're located under these two stores now. And then here's the Church of the Annunciation. And then, as I mentioned, um, behind the Church of the Annunciation um, is where eventually an excavation took place. It's been going on for three years now, and it will start again uh, in mid-August for about uh, two or three more work, uh, weeks of excavation. So this is behind the Greek Orthodox Church of the Annunciation. Um, the geophysical equipment at work. So this is electrical resistivity tomography. As Richard said, metal stakes are driven into the ground. Electrodes are hooked up to them, and then electricity is shot through them into the ground. It comes up, and there's a computer in this device, and it records all that information. Or ground penetrating radar. And this is the ground penetrating radar unit. You're shooting f radio waves into the ground, and then that signal is reflected back up again, and then it is interpreted by the software and the operator. To me, a non-geophysicist, I can look at the electrical resistivity tomography, and I'll show you some uh, printouts of that, and understand what's going on. Ground penetrating radar, it looks like squiggly lines to me. It takes an expert who's been doing it for years and years to say, this is what's here. This is where the corner of the building is. This is where the doorway is. Because it takes years and years to develop that skill to be able to interpret that kind of data. And what I do for my job for the project, I do all the mapping, and I pull all the spatial data together. So what is spatial data? That's any data that you can collect across the land surface or even below the land surface. And then I try to get all of that information, all of that data that we collect, into a form that's usable on a variety of different levels. It's important to the project and on the scientific level to record that data in a certain way, but then also to make maps and diagrams that are understandable to everyone and not just scientists. So here's a, a little story just to kind of show you how this equipment works. So this is inside the Church of the Annunciation, and this is going down to the lower level through this corridor, and then in the back is the water source. And then originally that's the reason we were there, because they were having bad leakage problems in the back. And they were getting all kinds of damage caused by that. And that was the initial reason that we went there, and the initial reason that we used electroresistivity tomography, or yeah, we used electroresistivity tomography and ground penetrating radar there. This is an electroresistivity plot of that area behind the church. So um, I'm going to focus in on this area, but more importantly, that area that's circled over there. And then one of the other things that we did is you, you can drag this equipment, the, the uh, ground penetrating radar, along the ground, or also you can push it up and down the walls. So it sees through the stone and tells you what's behind there. So here's a projection of that. Here's my point, squiggly lines. Da, da, da. The ground penetrating radar expert can interpret it, and he interpreted that there's a doorway, and there's a column, and all kinds of things behind the wall there. So then this is behind the church. This is an illegal excavation that took place in the 1970s. Um, we feel that someone knows, local officials know who did it, but they were not the vault who did it. It was illegal, it was unpermitted, and they dug up part of the area behind the church. So um, in terms of what I'm talking about, and there's the back wall of the church right there, and then this particular feature right here is important. So again, this is what I do. I create all the maps and diagrams to try to make things understandable. So here we are behind the church. There's the wall of the church. This is areas that eventually became areas that we excavated. This is actually inside the church, this corridor right here. And for effect, to show that it's in the same orientation, I flipped the corridor on its side here, and then here is the electroresistivity tomography plot. And very clearly, that corridor shows up. We say, well, big deal. We knew it was there because there it is right there. And that's good. true. But what was very intriguing was this feature right here. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, what is that? 
What is that feature there? So, um, did electroresistivity tomography there, did ground penetrating radar there, convinced local officials that there was something there and it should be excavated. Now, in uh, traditional times of archaeology, to do this excavation, you would lay all these lines out and then just start digging and digging and digging and digging until you found something. We could say, go here, go here, go into this two meter square, dig down, and you're going to find something there. So it was uh, fairly easy to get permission to do that. Now this is, after some excavation has taken place, so I've superimposed a photograph upon the map now, and this is that area of the illegal excavation, and then these are three excavations that we completed. And this area here matches up with what we see there. Okay? And what's important is what's under that blue tarp and what's under that blue tarp. So what's under there is a 4th century mosaic floor from the original church of the Annunciation. So 4th century CE, what's the significance of this floor? Richard's not only an archaeologist, but a historian, so he's going to have to stop me here if I'm wrong. Here's the significance. In 313 AD, Emperor Constantine uh, met with Lachinus in Milan, where they developed the Edict of Milan. And essentially what that stated was that Christians should be allowed to follow a faith without opposition. So that's essentially the birth of Christianity, right there. And uh, Constantine was so happy that this happened, he sent his mother on a pilgrimage to go across the Holy Land and find places of interest for Christianity. So, in from 26, uh, 326 to 3, uh, 326 to 328, she undertook this trip through the holy places of Palestine, and she ended up in Nazareth. Now, I'm making this part up here, but it could be close. So she shows up in Nazareth, and she says, what is there to see of religious significance here? And someone takes her to the spot where the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, you're going to have a son, and you're going to name him Jesus Christ. She said, we've got to build a church here. So they built a church here, and that is the floor, according to our theory, of that original church that was um, commissioned by uh, Helena Constantine's mother to build. There it is kind of pulled back. And what it looks like, uh, unfortunately, the whole floor is not there. Someone stole part of it. That may have been the reason why they did that illegal excavation, was to get that floor. They somehow knew it was there. Or they were just looking for things, and they took the floor. Or, I hate to even say this, they completely destroyed the floor and didn't even know what it was. And it just got thrown away with the rubble. So then here's the entire extent the floor actually continues over on this side for a little bit as well. And excavations continue. Uh, 2016 there were excavations. And um, this part of the site was uncovered. This feature here is very interesting. Um, we first surmised and have not made a final decision on it that it may be a baptismal font. And uh, the excavation continues. And like I said, in the middle of August, uh, the fourth season of excavation will take place. Okay. So on to Lithuania now. So um, Richard was approached by an Israeli archaeologist in 2014 who was uh, of Lithuanian descent and said, I have this really interesting project, the Great Synagogue of Vilnius, the largest synagogue in Eastern Europe, um, bombed in World War II, eventually destroyed by the Russians, completely uh, knocked down and pushed away, and then covered over by a school. So we got interested in that. We came to visit. So here's that school. And then here is the area around the school, and that's where we've been working for the last four years. So, if you look at an aerial photograph of that, here's the school. This yellow line is actually an outline of the bathhouse from the synagogue. The different colors represent different periods of excavation. So, blue. 2011, the Lithuanian government commissioned an excavation there, and they opened up five holes. Three holes. Three holes. Three holes. In 2016, that's when we did our first excavation, and that's those two. 2017, uh, another year of excavation, and then 2018 is what's happening now. 
uh, diggers are there and they were there until 4.30 today and will be there six days a week for the next two weeks uh, to finish out this season of excavation. And it is open to the public to come and look and see what they're doing there. So I urge you to stop by. And they're digging uh, here, 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 and they're probably going to open up some other places as well. Okay, so here is the electrical resistivity tomography for the area to one side of the synagogue. So the different colors represent different resistivities of the material. And again, an expert geophysicist can look at this and start to make some interpretations of where features are. This is what's called an IP anomaly. And a unique thing about electroresistivity tomography is that you can shoot the electricity into the ground, reflect it back, collect it, and produce this plot. But you can also then turn the machine off, and the electricity that you shot into the ground will be absorbed by any metal object, and it what's called ring. It will ring so that you can turn it back on and see the metal objects ringing and then see where the metal objects are that are buried in the ground as well. This one is so wonderful it has to be a sewer pipe or something like that. But then there are other metal objects as well. But this comes into importance when I'm going to talk about kind of ray and so This is um, what a GPR data plot looks like. These are slices of data. Starting with the surface and going down every few centimeters and seeing what's there. So I believe this one, you start at the surface there, and you go like this, and every time you're going down, down, down to a depth of probably about two and a half meters here, and seeing what's below the surface. So again, what do you see? Well, you see a whole bunch of different colors, and you see some places brighter, some places darker, and again, uh, the geophysicists can look at this and can pick out where the anomalies are, analyze those anomalies some more, and find where things are buried in the subsurface to then point the archaeologist to the right location. So here is the map um, of the Great Synagogue, uh, circa 2016. Now, it's a very busy map, meaning it's got a ton of stuff on it. It's got 106 layers of data on this particular map. And if I soft writing, I can turn the layers on and off so I can just show what I want to show. But in this one, all 106 layers are turned on. These are all the grids where we did GPR. And then all the different colored ovals are the spots where we're recommending excavation, some of which are high priority, some of which are lower priority, some of which are we should look at this place more before we decide if this is the place that we're going to excavate. And this particular area right here, where an electroresistivity line across a, a GPR line, ground planetary radar line, had a wonderful set of anomalies there, and that was chosen to be the first location for excavation in 2015. So, we move a little bit into the future. Here is that one particular anomaly. Here it is pulled out right here. So the one going in this direction is the electroresistive tomography anomaly, and the one going in that direction is the ground penetrating radar anomaly. So to have that intersection there and to have these two very, very distinctive anomalies show up, that's what led us to this particular location. Um, this map has the outline of the bathhouse projected onto it, and then this isn't in the proper place, but that is a side view of the bathhouse. It was a very large three-story bathhouse that was located at that site. And then here's some of the excavation uh, that's going on. This was the first year of excavation, so 2015. Um, but there today, it looks very different. There's a lot more uh, opened up now. Uh, the walls of the synagogue are exposed. Um, the walls of the bathhouse are in the process of being exposed. And you know, just one of the features. This is where that anomaly was. So what stood out so clearly was this intact arch feature that was buried. So here it is, like I said, you can turn layers of data on and off. This is lots of layers turned off. So now the only thing you can see is this is the school. This is the outline of the old synagogue. Um, and then these are all the GPR um, grids, ground penetrating radar grids, with all of the areas that we say excavation should take place. And then even more data turned off, and now we're getting down to some of the core maps that were created by other groups. One of the things I do is that I look for every map and every diagram I can find from a particular place, because the last thing I'm going to do is recreate something that somebody did already. 
Um, what I want to do is utilize what they've done already to add our materials to, um, to then paint this picture uh, most precisely of the uh, place we're looking at. So this is the original architectural plan from when the school was built in the middle 1950s. And then this is the outline of the synagogue with photos of three places of Brexit in 2011. And then this zooms in uh, a little bit more. And then from today, I took this picture today and put it in. Um, what we've been doing the last couple of days is we have enough data now um, that we feel we know where everything is under the school. So these are the walls of the synagogue, except that they're under the floor. And we've marked them with rocks. Um, this particular one is a solid group of lines because it was a solid wall that had about uh, a meter off the ground and then windows. These are, actually, these are two doorways here. So uh, a good visual representation of what's beneath. And then Richard mentioned the Holocaust Escape Tunnel. How many people have seen Holocaust Escape Tunnel? So good, four or five people. Um, so at Panerai, uh, we know the story of Panerai, that it was a killing field where uh, 100,000 people were murdered, 70,000 Jews. It was uh, a fuel depot that the Russians were constructing. They had dug out all the pits where they were going to put the fuel tanks. They had connected the pits together with trenches that they were going to use to run lines from one fuel tank to the other. And then the, the Nazis came in. They had to flee. So the depot was left, uh, left there. And the Nazis decided this was a, a great place to practice the, uh, what do you call it, uh, extermination by bullets. So Richard showed you the air photograph before. So we're always trying to get all existing data. So. Here is the site, and um, here is electroresistivity tomography taking place right there. And what this electrical resistivity tomography allowed us to do was to prove some of the folklore about the escape tunnel. As Richard said, there's always been rumored that there was an escape tunnel there. There are people that say, would say, I escaped out of that escape tunnel but there was no real scientific proof of its existence. So uh, there was a Lithuanian archaeologist, can you help, help me with his name, in 2004? Yes. Yes, I can't remember his name either. He did a project there in 2004 and thought that he had found the entrance to the escape tunnel. And he but, closed it up. And he closed it up and then wrote something about it and everybody just forgot about it after that. Well, we came in and did the electroresistivity tomography and found that feature right there at this location. The Jews that were the burning brigade who came when the Nazis started to get nervous that the Russians were coming and dug up the 100,000 bodies, burned them, and then reburied the ashes, lived in that, a bunker in that place. And every night, they would go and dig with spoons and with whatever, and they dug the escape tunnel eventually out of that location with that being the end. So, what we're doing now is we're moving away from that bunker feature and we're running lines of electrical resistivity, resistivity tomography across the land surface. So there's a line that went through there and look what we found right there. Or here, or here. So what is that? That's the escape tunnel. Um, there's nothing else that it could be. So putting them all together then, and then Besides the escape tunnel at Panare, and besides that riveting story of the escape that took place there, um, there were many other discoveries to be made as well. We did a project about trying to find where some of the processing trenches were. They would bring the Jews from Vilnius. They would tell them that they were in a work group and they were going to go to the forest. They would walk there, or they would ride in trucks, or they would ride by train. They would get there. They would confuse them, take them through the series of different tunnels, and then eventually take them to a place to be shot. Um, so uh, we did research about trying to find some of the uh, processing trenches, which we think we did. And then, so if we look at the whole site then, um, these are the pits, and this is the entrance to the Holocaust Escape Tunnel right here. All of these red lines are all the lines of electroresistivity tomography. And then that's the end of the escape tunnel. So if you saw um, Holocaust escape tunnel, um, they were digging, 
Um, they got up near the surface and started to collapse in. They poked their head out and saw that they were outside of the barbed wire. And they said, you know, let's go for it. And 11 got out. And um, I can't remember if it depicts it in the movie or not, but you have to imagine that they're all shackled together as they were digging this. And they were taking the shackles off and there was a little rattling noise and one of the guards heard that. So 13 were able to get away, um, uh, two were shot, and 11 survived the whole war. So um, that is the lines for the electric studio tomography for the tunnel. And then this is one line that we did that is a pro processing trench right here. And then, uh, as Richard said, there are other burial pits out there in the forest. So all of these lines here are different transects for electroresistivity tomography, and we also did ground penetrating radar at those locations. And here is the plots for that. So you see that feature, and that feature, and that feature, and that feature. And these are going across the landscape so it allowed the geophysicists to first surmise that there was formerly a pit there, because it's very different than everything else around it. If you dug a hole and then threw bodies in it and then reburied those bodies, it would certainly have a different signal than everything else that's around it, and that signal comes up very quick. So the existing pits, all of the data, and then here is where there was previously that unknown pit. And again, it's up to the Lithuanians, it's up to the owners of the property, the museum, what they want to do. How they want to memorialize that and preserve it. And then a, a little story here as well. Um, we worked on a project at the Rassau Street Prison. Um, Jacob Gens, I'm going to get Richard to help me with a 30 second description of who Jacob Gens was. Head of the Union Rat of the Vilna, Vilna Ghetto. He was the head of the Union Rat of the Vilna Ghetto. So his job was to pick who was going to go to the forest, to the work camps, and be murdered. Um, it just so happens that uh, his granddaughter lives in the same town Richard lives in. His daughter? Oh, his daughter. His daughter lives in, 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 my, in my town. That's right. His granddaughter lives in New York. Right. His daughter lives in the same town as Richard. His granddaughter approached Richard and said, I would love to find my father's body. Now, I'm not going to get into the politics of Jacob Gens and whether he was just a horrible, horrible person or whether he tried to preserve life as best he could, uh, but she wanted to find her grandfather. So um, this is a drone photograph that is enhanced by a software package that allows you to draw a topographic map of the land using the drone imagery. These are electroresistant tomography lines inside the bounds of the prison. So this is all inside of the walls of the prison. And then looking in real world, there's the electroresistivity lines laid out. Here are two lines right there. Here is an IP anomaly, meaning a metal anomaly at that location. And then here's that IP anomaly down here. So eventually, after looking at all the data, and that's a GPR anomaly, we had to decide on a spot that was most likely where he was buried. So that spot where we had the best signal for electroresistivity tomography indicating something was there and for ground penetrating radar there, and after all the researchers put our heads together, we said, this is the spot that we're going to excavate. So there it is. So <coughs> excavated for two days and uncovered a skeleton at that location um, in the, literally the last hour of excavation it was dug up. So, in my position that I have, uh, I'm the Dean of Sciences at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the US, and one of the things that I run that's part of my school is a DNA lab. So what we did was collect two teeth from this skeleton, export them to Pittsburgh, be analyzed for DNA. I sent one of my people to Hartford to take a swab out of his daughter's mouth so that we compare the DNA from the skeleton to the DNA of his dog. Here's what it says in the account of the murder of Jacob Gens. It says, right next to the wall, there is a grave of an executed Polish national. At his feet is the grave of an executed Gens. Gens. At Gens' feet, there is a grave of an executed Lithuanian. So then we came up with a theory about if this is Jacob Gens, who could be buried where. And it made sense to us. So um, we did the DNA analysis. 
Um, I have students do the DNA analysis because it's very important to, to involve students. But we had like five different students do it five different times to make sure that the data all matches up and they're somehow not making a mistake. And the data all matched up. And I'm not going to go through how you read a, a DNA plot. But this is, uh, this is the DNA from the tooth. And this is the DNA from Ana. Again, this is the daughter. And what we had was... There's 24 what are called loci in your DNA. And if you can match 22 out of 24, two of those are sex markers. And they will tell you whether it's a male or a female. So you eliminate the two sex markers and now you have 22 loci. If you can match 22 out of 22 loci from one sample to the next, they are related to each other, undoubtedly. Unfortunately, we were only able to match 12 of the 22 were an exact match, 8 were off by one loci, 1 was off by 2, and 1 was off by 3. It wasn't a good match. We were so excited, we thought we had found Jacob Jones. But, after then, searching and searching and searching for a laboratory that could do radiocarbon dating analysis on a tooth, we found one at the University of Georgia, and they dated the tooth and it was 200 years old. So it doesn't match up at all. And we found out a year later that, um, in fact, um, Soviets did archaeology at the Rastow Street Prison in the 50s and actually found a graveyard in that corner of the prison. So we were actually digging in an old graveyard that we didn't know about or no one told us about. So then it makes sense why that body is 200 years old. So we dug up someone who was buried in that graveyard. Is Jacob Gens buried there? We don't know. We may go back sometime in the future to look. And then the last thing, at the HKP forced labor camp. So here it is uh, back in the, the day of the 1940s. And um, here it is today in an aerial image. So these are the two main apartment buildings here, and then all the land in between. And then this is where the memorial is. And again, what I try to do is I try to make maps and diagrams that show what we did and make it obtainable and understandable for not just scientists. So this is the simplest map associated with this project. So there's building one. Here's building two. Here is a parking lot. We also did ground penetrating radar through the whole parking lot. Here is uh, an area. Um, here, uh, there's a small memorial here and a bigger memorial here. So we did an electroresistivity tomography line right through that area. And then we did two electroresistivity tomography lines behind this building, as well as ground penetrating radar behind this building. And what did we find? Well, we found very strong anomalies for disturbance here, here, and here. So what's the significance of that? <coughs> The significance of here and here is that the testimony was that um, when the Russians were at the door and ready to come uh, into Lithuania and into Vilnius, and the Nazis were trying to get out of town and try to kill as many Jews as they could at the last minute, came here, were able to find 250 Jews that were still here, and then lined them up and shot them with bullet hole marks in the walls here and buried them in a shallow trench. And actually buried them in two shallow trenches, one here and one here. And then um, this represents an anomaly that we think that there's a mass burial. Because what happened was, they were buried in that shallow grave. The Nazis then fled. The people that had escaped from here, which was on the order of like 800 people, had escaped before the Nazis came to kill everybody, came back and dug the bodies up and then buried them in a mass grave. So this is where they were originally buried, and then they were dug up and then buried over here in this mass grave. And then Richard mentioned the Molina. So this is an original architectural plan for the apartment building when it was built in 1898. And um, the Molina in this particular case um, is located in this building, in this particular section. So this is a pullout of that section. And then what do you see there? Well, these are the stairs as you come down. There's actually a small room behind the stairs. And then 
You go around this corner and you can go back into the rest of the basement. So they did ground penetrating radar here. And then based on testimony and based on information in a book that Michael Good wrote about this, is that there was a trap door that you could go down through, pop up on the other side of the wall, and over 100 people hid in a very small room as the Nazis were going through all the buildings trying to find everyone and round them up and shoot them. Um, so here is where the trap door was, right there. The ground penetrating radar showed that. And then this is the so-called Molina, the place of hiding, where over 100 people hid from the Nazis while they were trying to gather up there. So, in closing, um, as Richard said, I think we're pioneering a new way of approaching archaeology. We started this over 20 years ago, and I can say with a lot of confidence, nobody else was doing it. Um, there are certainly other people now that are doing it because they see the fact that traditional archaeology, laying out that grid, starting to dig, if you don't even know if there's anything there where you're digging or not, you don't know if you're five feet away from this feature that you're trying to find, or this wall of some ancient city or something, but using the geophysics, it can point the archaeologists in the right place. They can save time. They can save money. They can save effort by knowing where to dig and then digging out these features. So um, we'll be in Lithuania for the next two weeks, finishing up the Great Synagogue. That, that uh, excavation will go on for two more weeks there. We're going up north to work on several projects as well, ending up in Kaunas to um, have a meeting about a project we're going to do next year in Kaunas. So I would anticipate that uh, you will see a lot of us in the future because we keep coming back to Lithuania. Uh, it's a place that we love the people. We love uh, doing the research here. Um, the government has become very cooperative with us. So I think we have a very good partnership that we've built. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the story. And uh, well, we are for questions. Question time. Yeah. My fellow, I have a Sure. As you know, I thank you for your presentation. That was so informative, and I, I wish you the well in, uh, well in your future in your projects. It's not invasive uh, knowledge. I was not familiar with it. And I do have a question about the Church of the Annunciation in sure. Nazareth. Uh, as you know, uh, all archaeology in Israel is so politically, theologically charged. How, what makes you feel confident that that 4th century mosaic floor is not from a private residence? First of all, yeah. location, location, location are the three laws of archaeology. And what that means is this has been a documented site for about 1,200 years. Pilgrims who came there, it's only well in the entire location. And the church has been destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt multiple times in the same location. So that's one of the most important things. Second thing is, when you look at the, the absolute uh, uniqueness of the design, you think, oh, so no other uh, church is like that? Every other church from the same time period has the same floor. Ours is a little bit more unique. So I, I'll say one thing about it is it's a little bit more unique but it's like the other 5th century, 6th century churches. The difference is, we just did carbon 14, not only on the floor that we found, we also found there's another floor below it. So if you can imagine what we're looking at now, is we want to see what was below the 4th century. We want to see the 1st century. And if you don't think that and the entire Christendom is looking at that kind of project, and they're interested in it, that's what they're interested in. And you know, that is an amazing thing. I have to tell you, it's very difficult to work in a lot of contexts in archaeology in Israel. The reason why we're being able to do this is we've had success at other sites. And uh, if there's anything that archaeology can do, it can cut across religious, philosophical, theological, lines. And that's the, the good news about this kind of technology. So I'll tell you, it's unique. Location is pretty, pretty secure. And I'm happy that the sponsors of the excavations are not the government. It's the Greek Orthodox Church. 
because they want to see that this is uh, this is done. And it's made it. I would have gave that same answer. So I'm going to give. Um, it's made it. Uh, here's my impression of the first project I did in Israel was 1999, and it can be a very hard place to work uh, because of competition amongst archaeologists and the permitting process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But to be working in Nazareth, which is an Arab city in Israel, and then to have the backing of the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, you know, say we have that greases the wheels, that makes things work much more easily. So it helps you uh, avoid some of the political pitfalls you might have working in other areas. And I can't say that it's been easy um, to get everything done, to get all the cooperation we did, or we need, but I think it's been easier than many and many other projects that we've done there. Not to mention, I have to say, one of my students, who is my co-director, Mahad Rausha, uh, is a professor in my department of Judaic Studies. Uh, she taught Arabic and Hebrew for us. She's a Muslim woman archaeologist from Nazareth. And one of the reasons why I was able to do what we do is because of her. And so we have a Muslim, we have a Jew, and the Greek Orthodox Church to work in one project together. So. And a Roman Catholic. And a Roman Catholic. <laughs> and so, I mean, for, for us, this is really a, a unique situation. I think it's a unique situation for Israel. So. Any other questions? Okay. Do you continue to, do, do you intend to continue investigation in Panere? Because there are many, many places that require those investigations. So, here is what happens every year. Uh, people come up with ideas. They would like us to do things. Uh, they ask us if we can go and do it. We prioritize. We want to see, you know, I don't know if you know, you probably do know that there are about 200 sites in um, Lithuania that need investigation. So, every year if I can do four or five and then bring back and my students will do it in another generation, we will be totally finished in Lithuania. So I, I think that there's a lot more to be do, done in Panare. Uh, I don't administer it. The, the, the tolerance center that, that is there for view, but we're open to do projects, but we only can come, by the way, I get the equipment for two weeks a year. Mm -hmm. Two weeks a year that we, and we have all this equipment, and I have to find funding, I have to find, to, get, to, to pay for people to come over from the United States, from Canada, the shipping, and I buy liability insurance, and I have to find students. It's a, a year-long thing, and I have a day job. I teach at the University of Hartford, and this is what I do for a living. This is what I do as a part of a research commitment, and, uh, but we are still sure there's much more to see at Banda Day. Uh, I would like to ask, I heard that Simcha, Simcha Yakubovich is a world famous producer now in Vilnius and he uh, do a lot of documentary about Holocaust. So if it's not a secret, would you appear on a new Simcha Yakubovich movie about uh, maybe it will be a documentary about those findings in Great Sinkop site or in Ponari, Ponari Forest? You know, the uh, Simcha's company, Associated Producers, did the uh, Hakape documentary. It's going to be on Nova in, next spring. This year, we brought a totally different TV crew to do the work in, in Rokiskis. And we're pretty sure that next year at this time, when we come back, you can go to the Tolerance Center and you'll be able to see a new television documentary about uh, Lithuania, about another story that I think is, will tell us more about uh, what happened here during the Holocaust. So that I can tell you. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be Simplis company or some other company that will produce it, but we are working with a TV crew right now. Uh, sorry. One more question. You told that you are always offering your work for free. For free. But you told a plenty of things which are to be paid. 
delivering the machinery, finding the resources for people and so on. So who is interested for that work of your team in Lithuania? Who is financing it? Well, no one, no one in, in Lithuania. I don't, I, first of all, I can't, can't accept money from television companies. That's unethical. Can't accept money from television companies. Um, the government up until now was not giving us any money. The Jewish community was not giving us any money. I was raising the money. Philip was raising the money from foundations, from our own universities, from individuals. But part of this is you want to be able to say that we know what we know and we can't change history by being paid by a source that is tainted. So part of it is we have to go out and raise the money every year, find the right types of foundations to go to. But, um, you know, I have to say, um, a lot of people have taken notice of what we do. And we apply to foundations to, uh, to get funding, to, to bring up. And by the way, we don't take salaries, just so it's unclear. None of us take salaries. Our universities do not make any money on this. We don't make one cent on any television documentary. We're not allowed to accept any gratuities for all of this work. But we feel that this is what needs to be done in terms of educating the public. And this is, this is what the next generation is going to see. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. And if you have anybody who, or foundations that you know of you think we should apply to, Happy to accept the, 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 the idea, but I have to say the U.S. Embassy has been giving us small grants for the past three years, because I'm an American university, and they think it's good for U.S. scientists to be working with Lithuanian scientists, if you understand what I'm saying. It's good to have that collaboration. Um, the U.S. Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad uh, is a Senate committee. They give us small funding as well, but it, it's, we have to go out and we have to search every year. So if you have an idea for a project that you think we should do, I'm happy to, to accept the idea. If you have an idea where I should go for funding, I'm also happy to accept that idea. Me personally, I was very happy to have that proof that archaeology is real about people as I'm digging into the ground. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, I know you're going to Rumsheskes, it's going to be something new, and you're going to Rumsheskes also. So, uh, Rumsheskes is very, has an interesting story to become uh, known maybe to more people. Could you comment something, what you're going to do? Well, we're doing, we're doing four, four projects, uh, in four areas, in the greater Rumsheskes area. So, we're doing the Manor House, if you don't know about the story of the Manor House, in Rokesh it was a very nice Jewish community there, five, 6,000 people that were basically wiped out. But they had been there for 300 years. And part of what we're trying to do is preserve the history of each of these different regions. And there's archaeologists who've already been working there, the Man Manor House. Uh, Panadel, uh, which is a city nearby, um, there is actually really good documentation from people who came from Bunnedale in the United States, mapping of all the locations where the synagogue was, bathhouse was, where the mikvah was, where the, the Bez Midrash was. So we have really good, and it's right, it's very nearby. Tarakas was a Holocaust site. There was also uh, a small Jewish community in the, in the area. But Hanemunelis was the home of, I think, one of the most important figures that nobody's heard about. The Anne Frank of Lithuania. There was a woman by the name of Matilda Olkin, who was a Jewish poetess, who died. Her whole family was murdered on the road in 1941. Her diary was found, and in her diary, it was a story of her life, 1938 to 1941, when she died, and her poems. 
and there's been a, a, a new play that was produced, uh, and it, um, I think it resonates for Lithuanians. She wrote in a beautiful Lithuanian. She didn't write in Yiddish, she didn't write in Hebrew, but her Lithuanian Jewish soul comes through. And people can read it and understand what Lithuania was like in 1940, 1941, through the eyes of a young teenager, just like Anne Frank. And we're hoping that we find, in the case of Anne Frank, we don't know what Anne Frank is buried. Terrible thing. We don't know the end of the story with Anne Frank. Anne Frank dies in an extermination camp. We don't know where she's buried. We have a diary. Think how Anne Frank has inspired millions of people throughout the world. I think that the, the words of Matilda may inspire people. And people will think of the way he would say what the world has lost. So part of this is to tell stories about people. But through archaeology, through science. So I think, and I'll just tell you, I hope that you use these is I think the next frontier in Holocaust studies is going to be science. Because now, in another generation, we will not have all of those live witnesses to tell us. So we have to then find a new way to tell their stories to this new generation. And I think science will be the frontier will help us all. So. Yeah, this is very, very interesting and important. Right today, Professor Vesete, uh, cited me another famous literary critic, uh, Vito Vescovidus, who actually was uh, confirming that some of her translations of classical European poetry into Lithuanian right. were the best ever. Uh, so this is something to, to find about Matilda Ultimate more. Uh, and well, as far as I hear now from you, I have that impression that something you, there is a chance that you're going to, to be doing in, in Rumsheshtis, I never hear you doing up anywhere else. So is that true that well, you, didn't, it's, you didn't try to see beneath the, the earth from the water before that? Okay. <laughs> First of all, if, if for those of you who don't know, uh, the Living Museum in Rumsheshtis, does everybody know? Yes? Okay. So it is outside of Kaunas. It's a very important location. Uh, Kovno, Kaunas is a, is a place that, where people don't have enough vision to see something more at a living museum than just 19th century Lithuanian general culture. I think it could be a much more diverse place. One of the things is that there was a Jewish village right there on the edges of what is now underwater. They, when they built the dam, when the Soviets built the dam there, they flooded the Jewish... Well, it's both, Jewish and Lithuanian. Jewish and Lithuanian. They just used to live together. Yeah. In, the, in this village, the, the Jewish village is underwater. So people have asked me, can you do anything underwater? The same things we can do above ground we can do underwater. So uh, if we find that we can find the right partners and if we find that we can actually uh, find the funding, you will see I think an extremely different uh, living museum that will be not only above ground but maybe under the water as well. Stay tuned. As they say, stay well, the drones under the water, I was impressed. You said that kids want to touch the, the rocks with their hands, but then they would be pushing uh, the also buttons right. and, and driving drones under the water. But they, they can see, if the village is still there, underneath the water, we can take robotically operated vehicles, and sh they can actually see the entire village without having to go underneath the water and, and destroy it. The interesting thing is, in this case, just like at the Great Synagogue, the Soviets thought that they were destroying Jewish culture and life by 
building a school on top of the great synagogue, or flooding the, 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 the village. They inadvertently, ironically, had preserved it for all time. You never know. 